All right, I am not talking about when he said, I am the light of the world. Jeremy did that a couple weeks ago, but if you could turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. So this morning we are uh, in our series called I Am. So uh, we kicked this off, Scott kicked this off before um, they left on their sabbatical uh, at the beginning of May, and then um, we've gone over a couple of these I Am statements. And what this is about is the different I Am statements that Jesus made during his time in his ministry. And so we've already talked about a couple. We talked about I am the bread of life. Um, a few weeks back, a couple weeks ago, Jeremy uh, preached on I am the light of the world and what that looks like. And so today we're going to jump into the next one. But before we do, we talk about this series, I am, and then he follows all these statements. Why is it so significant when Jesus says I am? So there's a lot of different things that we, we're going to go over, I think seven different I am statements that he made, but why is the I am statement itself so significant? Well, the interesting thing here in John chapter 10, just a couple chapters before that, we actually get a pretty good picture of the significance here. There was, um, Jesus was teaching, and a lot of times when Jesus would teach, it would turn into a debate. Has anybody had a conversation that just turned into a debate all of a sudden? Yeah, okay. So Jesus had that all the time. He would just be teaching something, and he made some very profound statements, um, things that were very divisive at times. He made major claims. And so there was a time in chapter 8, he ends up debating with some Jews that he was teaching to, and he, because he said the statement, he said, if, if you obey my commands, then you will never see death. As far as anyone who obeys um, his word, he actually said the son of man, okay? Anybody who obeys Jesus' word, though, he said he will never see death. And the Jews were like, this man is demon-possessed. Have you ever been called demon-possessed? I haven't, okay? But they, they, there are multiple times in the past, they say this man is demon-possessed. Even Abraham, our father, they would always, often Jews would go back saying we are sons of Abraham, talking about the covenant, right? That's really what they're referencing. He said, even Abraham died and all the prophets. And they said, do you think you're greater than Abraham? And they literally said this, who do you think you are? And this is where Jesus responds here. And he says that your father Abraham said, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. And he said, but then he said this, and he saw it and was glad. And so that, to that, they're like, you are crazy. They say, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Like this guy. They like, don't even ask a question. They don't ask him that question. They just say, this, he's not even 50 years old, and he thinks he's seen Abraham. He's a lunatic. All right? And this is what Jesus responded with, though. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That's why it's powerful. When Jesus, every, every time that Jesus says, I am, he is making a statement of the deity of Jesus Christ. That, because he said, some translations will say that before Abraham was born, I am. I am is a present tense statement. Okay, and when he says that, he says, I am. Jesus has no beginning or no end. God has no beginning or no end. And so when he's claiming this, he is claiming the, the, the deity, he is claiming the eternal life that comes from him, the eternal nature that he has. So when, when we see him say, before Abraham was, I am, all right, that, at that point, they were actually very upset. It says they picked up stones to stone him, and he like slipped away and because and, it wasn't time yet. Okay, so, because they knew what that meant. They knew he was claiming that. And so make no mistake, anytime we, we, we go through these I am statements, it, this is specifically about the eternal nature of Jesus and the deity of Jesus. And then there's specific statements, and those tell us a little bit what does that mean for us. If Jesus, is, if he is the I am, okay, and he says these different statements like I am the bread of life, that's telling what it means for us that Jesus in his eternal nature and what he did for us, what that means for us. So he's the bread of life, he's the light of the world. And today we are looking at John chapter 10, verse 9. Verse 9, it says this, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. I am the gate. Let's pray over the word of God today. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these statements. I thank you for the claiming of the I am, and I pray that you would just help us know and really grasp what this means for us today and give us perspective in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, so context here. You know, a couple weeks ago when I uh, was, was preaching, I was talking about the context is really important. A few weeks back, I was preaching on the, when he said, I am the bread of life. And that happened the day after he had fed the 5,000 from two fish and five loaves. Okay, and so when he's saying that, it really kind of makes sense. What's happening here is a little different, though. I won't go into everything. There's a lot of teachings and other things. But at the beginning of chapter 9, he, um, he runs into a, a man that was born blind. Okay, and so he puts, uh, he spits in the mud. Okay, this is that story. Spits in the, the, so the dirt, I should say, makes mud out of it, wipes it on the guy's eyes, and then he tells him to go wash in the fountain. The, that's called Siloam, means scent. And he washed in that, and he could see. This is a guy who'd never seen before in his life. It says, born blind, and he opened his eyes. Okay, and then, so of course, he goes around. He doesn't even know much about Jesus, okay? He just ran into him. Knew, I mean, he knew, of course, of the miracle work he had, he had done, but so he's just claiming what had happened. I was blind. Now, see, people in that area knew him. He was, he was, he was blind from his birth, okay? Uh, it sounds like he might have been a young man, but, but he, he, could, he would never see. He could see. So he's claiming this, and then the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they get upset, and they bring him in to question him, and this is where he's saying, all I know is I was blind, but now I see, okay? That's this guy. And he's talking, they even talk to his parents. They bring his parents in and try to have them testify and he, he said, and about that he was born blind. And they tell him, yes, he was born blind. And, they say, and then they try to get him to say, did Jesus you know, was the one to open his eyes? And they, they know what they were after and they were scared, honestly. And they just say, uh, you can, he's of age, ask him. Like they, and they tell him, ask him. And so he just keeps, he just gets, that's when he's saying, man, I was blind and now I see. And Jesus, the one opened my eyes. And so they cast him out of, of, of this, these meetings or hearings, whatever it was, they cast him out. The funny thing is, after it cast him out, it says that when Jesus heard they cast him out, he's like, I got to find this guy. Again, it's kind of funny. Like when he says, he hears they cast him out, he's like, I like this guy. Let me go talk to him some more after this. And so uh, Jesus talks to the healed man and tells him this. He says, for judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And that, was verse, that was chapter 9, verse 39. And the Pharisees overhear this, some of them that were nearby, and they ask if they, if they are also blind. Say, are we blind as well? And so Jesus' response continues into chapter 10. That's, that's, this is that response. Even in 941, I don't have that um, in your notes, but it says, Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. And then he goes into our passage for today. So that's kind of the context. He's answering this question of whether they are blind and what it really means, what Jesus meant by that statement. So chapter 10, verse 1, if you guys have your Bible, look there, it says this, very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will run away from, um, but yeah, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So Jesus used this figure of speech. But the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. His teaching continues there, but the interesting thing is the next, today's I am statement, and in two weeks, I'll be talking about the next one. They're all in the same spot here, okay? The next, in two weeks, we'll talk about I am the good shepherd, and that's the next, his next statement. But it's interesting the way, and I'll talk more about that next week, um, the way these are connected and why he talked, said I am the gate first, and then he talked about being the good shepherd, and there's kind of two, two parts to this illustration that Jesus is putting forth here to try to tell them who he is. So he says, I am the gate, or some translations say, I am the door. 
And, he's, and we see here, even in, uh, up in chapter, or verse 7, he says, I am the gate for the sheep. And he's talking about a sheep. So what does this mean for us? Why, why, we talk about when Jesus says, I am, he's talking about his eternal nature and, and, and the, the significance of him being fully God as well as fully man. But what does it mean for us specifically that he is the gate? What significance does it hold for us? So when, he, when Jesus says, I am the gate, first off, he's saying this, through Jesus, as the true Messiah, we can find salvation. Okay, through Jesus, the true Messiah, we can find salvation. In our, in our verse for the day, verse 9 says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Okay? So here's what's important about understanding this. How many of you guys are shepherds or own sheep? How many of you guys own sheep? No one. Wow. In northern Indiana, we got none. We got no sheep. Okay. So this, this, this thing, we, we get the whole like, oh, you'll be saved. Okay. You, so you're like, I kind of own sheep. Okay. He owns half a sheep. All right. So <laughs> no, this, this, this illustration is kind of lost. We think, oh yeah, whoever, he's the gate, you know, whoever comes in through him will be saved. And we kind of get that, but we don't quite get the illustration. He's talking to people that it was very common for them to be shepherds, own sheep, have shepherds that watched sheep. Even a lot of the ancestors of the Jews were shepherds at one point. Even look at Moses that we talked about in the beginning of the series. He was a shepherd when he was in kind of the wilderness before he saw the burning bush and was sent to Egypt. It was very common to talk about some of this stuff, but it's not as common for us. And so what would happen is if you had a flock of sheep, you would then um, at night when it was time to, to sleep, and the shepherd would need to sleep, they would then bring the sheep into what was called a sheepfold, which is where you would take all the sheep and put them together in some kind of structure. Okay, that could be a cave, a shed, some other kind of enclosed area made of like sticks or even stones that they kind of put together to make this area maybe eight to 10 feet high. Something that would, they could put all the sheep in close together and it would have one opening. So like a, a cave is the easiest way to think of this, right? Cave should have one opening. If it has another one, you're probably in trouble. But if it has one opening and then the shepherd could guard just that one opening and the rest of it was, was protected, okay? And so that made it easier. And sometimes they would even, um, shepherds would, uh, multiple shepherds would use the same fold. So they'd bring like all the, the several flocks in together and that way they could kind of take turns guarding that one gate or, or entrance or door but it's interesting that they actually didn't often have a door, like a cave doesn't have a door. Or if you kind of built something around in stones, you, you wouldn't necessarily have a door, but the shepherd could sleep in the doorway, in the opening, and he's saying, I am the gate for the sheep. So it's the first part of saying that he is the shepherd. But the biggest thing is this, understanding, if people he's talking to understood what a sheepfold looked like in their day and when he says i am the gate he's saying this no one comes into the fold except through me because that's what the shepherd was doing he would even some of them sleep in that because it would stop the sheep from wandering out but it would also if something came in he's like you got to get through me before you get to these sheep and we'll talk more about that in two weeks okay <laughs> but we won't, well i just wanted to give you a little something there but here's the thing he says no one comes into the fold except through me, I am the gate. You see, earlier in chapter eight, before he had healed the blind man, we talked about in um, chapter nine, he heals the blind man. In chapter eight, which we mentioned a little bit about that, but even earlier in that, um, Jesus had been teaching and, and dealing with some of the people not understanding his statements. He makes these huge statements of, their, of this exclu exclusion and this transformation based on himself. And because of that, they would often respond, and especially the people of Israel, and in chapter 8, we see this. He makes a statement, and then they would respond uh, by saying, we are the offspring of Abraham. Okay? That was, that was, we got into one of them when they said, you know, they talk, talking about Abraham. But earlier they had said, well, we're the offspring of Abraham. Meaning when they would say that, is he's making this statement like something like, I am the gate. Or in, in earlier in chapter 8, he's, he's saying something else. But they would make this statement, and his response would be, uh, their response would be, well, we're sons of Abraham. We're offspring of Abraham. What they were saying was, we're in the line of Abraham, therefore we are the people of God. Because Abraham was the first covenant, right? With Abraham, all the way back in, in, the, in the book of Genesis, and when they say that, they're saying, but we are the people of God. We are already in that. And so Jesus here, when he makes those other statements, or even in chapter nine, he says, I am the gate, and no one comes into the fold except through me. There's the only one way to enter, 
to those he would, that would say, but we're sons of Abraham. You know, we, we, that doesn't count for us. Jesus is saying, nope. And that's why he got in arguments a lot, all right? Because that's what he's saying. He's like, no. He's saying your status. He says your birthright, uh, your heritage, your bloodline in their case. And for us, it might be your class, your earthly success, your deeds, your knowledge, all that stuff. He says none of that brings you into the fold. I am the gate. Understand who he's talking to here. They're saying we're already in, we already are the people of God. And he says, no, that doesn't do any good. He says, I, I am the only way into the fold. The only way to be saved, to be rescued from the evil in this world is to be brought into the fold through the one gate and the one door. Understand that Jesus came to save you. Luke 19 says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. John 3, 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus came to save you and I, to be the redemption of the world. The reason they would put the sheep into the fold at night was because it protected them from predators or thieves or bad weather, all the things in, in the world that could come against them or damage those sheep or kill them or whatever it was. And he would put them in there for that reason. And Jesus is saying, I am the gate to the fold because I have come to save you from the things in this world that would try to bring you down. You know, and if the last couple of years have, have shown me anything, it has reminded me of the fallen nature of the world. And I'm not, I'm not saying that because, because like, oh man, the last couple of years have been so horrible. More just because of a lot of the things that have happened and decisions that were made and, and the way people reacted to things, it just reminded me of just the fallen nature of the world. That, that we're lost, that we, we need a shepherd, that we just have no other salvation on our own. And that's sometimes the problem with having a blessed life. And I'll just say, if you're sitting in this room, you have a blessed life. Whatever you're dealing with, we have, we have a blessed life. We do. We, we are blessed here in our country, in our time. And it often, I think we are desensitized to our personal as well as our global need for rescue and for salvation from the things of this world, and um, as believers, that not sh that shouldn't only we should only be thankful for our salvation through Jesus, but we should be also reminded and compelled that there are those that are still lost. When we hear that Jesus has come to save the world, it, it should remind us of that. Or when we see the fallen nature of the world, it should remind us not only, "Oh, thank you, Lord, for your salvation," but it should be, "Man, there are so many more that need." Jesus, God desires to save them. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If that's God's desire, that should be our desire. And when we hear about salvation, I think sometimes in the church, we hear about you are through the gate, you are saved and we're just like, yes, thank you, awesome, I get it. But it's like, that should compel us as well. That he has come, he says, through me. And he's saying, only through me. If that is the only way, then we should be compelled to let others know that it is the only way. One of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest uh, thoughts on that I've seen one time was a guy, it was an atheist guy, talking about how somebody had come and proth proselytized the gospel, like meaning they had come and tried to you know, convince him of that, gave him a little Bible. And, and he had said, and, and it didn't, he didn't respond to it by giving his life, life to Christ, okay? It was misconstrued, actually, and people thought that. And he didn't. But he said, I always, in that he said this, he said, I always respect people that proselytize because he said, how much would you have to hate someone that a train was bearing down on them and you wouldn't tell them? And that was his thought. He didn't, he was an atheist. He's like, I don't believe that. I think it's, it doesn't make any sense or whatever. But he said, if you truly believe that, why wouldn't you be telling people? How much would you have to hate people? To, in other, and this is, again, this is from an atheist, and I'm not saying that you hate people if you don't tell people about Jesus, but that's kind of the, the thought, though, is like if, if Jesus is saying he is the only way, he is the gate, the door, this is it. If we want to love people, we have to tell them that. And we can't, be, we can't worry about, man, I, I might offend them, or what are they going to think? Or It's like it, it, the opposite speaks more. And to hear even an atheist say that, he's like, how much would you have to hate me to say that you wouldn't tell me that there's a train coming to just destroy me as I'm standing on the tracks? 
And so I just encourage you, as we see this salvation, I think sometimes in the church, again, we're just kind of desensitized from it. And again, some of it's because we have the blessed hope. Okay? Jesus is the blessed hope. He is the only hope. I often, you know, we often, my wife Courtney and I, we often say, like, I don't know how people make it without Jesus. I don't get it. Like, we did not have that hope in there. And it's like, if that is not only a thankful thing, but God, I thank you. When I read this, that... Um, that I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. Not only thank you, Jesus, for myself, but that's the only way to be rescued from this world. Then that should mean something for me in letting people know. When Jesus says, I am the gate, he is saying that I am salvation. And he's saying, I am salvation for the world, for everyone. Second thing is this, freedom. Freedom. Through Jesus, the true Messiah, we can find freedom. You see that next to the pasture, okay, there would be the enclosed area. And I say next to, it could have been right next to it, but it may have been in an area, there's some space between where they would take the sheep into the cave or whatever it was. But you had the pasture and you had the fold and they were not the same place, okay? And so in, in, in verse nine here, I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. And then it says they will, they will come in and they will go out. And there's some freedom implied in here. And see, the thing is, when you have the, you have the fold and you have the pasture, and what would happen is you could bring those sheep into the fold, and they came into the fold to f- had protection from the elements, the weather, the wild animals, the thieves. But then the pasture was where the sheep would graze, that's where they would eat, that was where they were, would go and be sheep, you know. That's what they do. I don't know what they do, all right? They're sheep, like, I don't have them, I told you that, okay? But, but, there, but understand this, there was a lone gate between those two things. And Jesus says, I am the gate. And he says, and they'll go in, and they'll come out. There is freedom in Christ. See, John 8, 31 and 32 says this, too, um, he said this, this is again in chapter 8, a little before what we were talking about, to the Jews who believed him. And just on that, what that means is he was teaching and then there was people that stayed around. I mean, it was really what it meant because these are the same people that end up arguing with him and try to stone him later, okay? So I just, just making that distinction. He just, so you're not like, oh, the Jews that believed him, is this his disciples? Not necessarily. He's just teaching. Some of them leave because they're like, you're crazy. These people hadn't thought that yet and they do in a little bit. But anyway, okay, so Jesus said this. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this is one of those times I mentioned earlier when Jesus, uh, when people didn't understand, okay, and, and, they, and in this case, because like, he, he says, if, if you hold to my teaching, you are truly my disciples, and the, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he's talking to the Jewish people, and they say, but we're descendants of Abraham. That's the response. They said, we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. How, how, could, how is this guy going to set us free. And I think often as human beings, that is our response to some of these statements of Jesus, these, these exclusive statements, because Jesus is saying, I am the gate, right? And he says here, if you do what I command, then you will never find death, or in this case, you, the, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And, and he's making these statements. And I think that's often our response, the same as them. Not that we say we're descendants of Abraham, but that we say, I've never been a slave, Think about it. When we talk about the freedom in Christ, you might think of somebody right now that they, that's what they struggle with. Like, why would, I, why would I choose that when I have freedom already? And that doesn't look like freedom. And that's exactly what the Jewish people responded with as well. They just had, they just had a, a spiritual, biblical kind of covenant way, but it was the same response. They said, we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anything. How are you going to free us? In fact, it's, it's a common hang-up for people. I mean, it th- maybe you have been there in your life, or maybe you're there right now. As you see, and you're like, that's, what, that's what's stopping me. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I could go all into this because I feel I like this freedom I have, and that seems like not the opposite of that. It seems like bondage. It seems like I'm being told to do this or that. Um, or, or maybe you know somebody like this, all the do's and don'ts and the things. And the tr- hey, here's the truth. There are do's and don'ts. You know, we like to say, hey, there's no, you know, that's not what it's about. And I'm not saying it's about that. It's about our relationship with Jesus. But there are do's and don'ts. Even in this, this passage we just read, he said, if, he said, if you hold to my teaching, 
you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth. If you hold to my teaching, if you do what I tell you to do, then you're really my disciples. How is that freedom? I don't feel like a slave right now, so what am, are you freeing me from? But then this, is, this was Jesus' reply to them in, in chapter 8, 34 through 36, says this. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. He says, so if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. And you see, we are all slaves to our own destruction. And that's what Jesus was telling these people. He said, but if you're a slave to sin, or if, you're, if, you're, if you are involved in sin, if you are involved in the things of this world, you are a slave to it, and you don't even know it. The thing is, we can be slaves and not even know it. Because we are slaves to our own destruction. And from a worldly perspective, the sheepfold can look like constraint until you experience the freedom from the destructive forces that are outside of this world, in this world. Understand that you look, at a, you look at a sheepfold and it looks like it's got walls, it's got one door, and you're telling me he's not gonna let me out sometimes? And sometimes he'll make me go in there? But again, it's one of those things from a worldly perspective, we see that, that cave with one entrance that's guarded by the shepherd and we just think, I, that doesn't look like freedom. But then for those that have experienced that one, and think about it, Man, in that sheepfold, when you experience their freedom from all the predators and the wild animals and, and all the thieves and all the things that they're protecting those sheep from, it feels a whole lot like freedom, doesn't it? And see, that's the thing we've got to understand. When we're slaves to sin, it feels like freedom. But then when you experience what it's like to be freed from those things, man, it, you, didn't, you realize, I didn't know what freedom was. And now I do. Jesus gives us freedom from sin and that just brings a whole new perspective, a whole new definition to freedom. And here's the cool part. With Jesus as the gate, remember there's, there's the pasture um, and, and then there's the fold and he's the, he's the space between. That's the analogy he's making, the illustration. And, and, and he's saying they'll go in and go out. And the freedom that is in that is this. This is the cool part. When, I, when you need refuge, when you need protect, when you need that, Jesus says, here, Come on in. It says, God is my refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. And that's what it, we're free to receive that from the Lord when we're in the fold. But man, when we need, we need to be let out, we need to go, we need to do what we're being called to do, what we, our purpose here is. Jesus says this way right here. And he takes us there. Guys, there's freedom in Jesus. There's freedom in in Christ, and Jesus leads us to good pasture. He brings us into the fold when we need refuge. When Jesus says, I am the gate, he is saying that I am freedom. I am freedom. Third thing is this. Through Jesus, the true Messiah, we can find eternal life. Eternal life. It says they will come in and go out and find pasture. I mean, there are so many elements to this illustration from Jesus, but the bottom line here is this. When Jesus says the sheep will find pasture through the gate, he is saying that we find eternal life through him. That's the bottom line. You know, I was joking earlier um, with the team, and I just, I'll just give you a, a synopsis of the entire I Am series. All of it points to eternal life. I just want to tell you that. Just so you know that, every one of them does, because that's what Jesus came to tell us. And he was constantly claiming, it's why, again, we talked about why is it so important when he says, I am. It's because he's eternal. And so when he says, I am this for you, he is saying it's through that, because I am eternal, because I am God, come to rescue you. He says, this is why I can provide all these things. When Jesus says the sheep will find pasture through the gate, he is saying that we find eternal life through him. And more importantly, he's saying there is no other way. Look at verse 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
okay? Jesus talks about the thief here. He's, it, when, he's, when he talks about that, he's talking about those that come and unjustly take what's theirs, right? That's what a thief is. They're, for their own personal gain, they take things. It's about being led astray. And that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about false messiahs. He's talking about people that would lead us astray, try to give us some. To give us another way, some counter, something counterfeit they would offer to us, but it only ends in death and destruction. Say so any other way, it may look like you're getting out of this, this fold, but it's leading to the wrong thing. And Jesus came so that we may have life and have it to the full. He says, the thief comes to still kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life, and he says, and have it to the full. You know, Courtney and I watch um, a lot of British shows. I don't know. I know I, you found out last week I drink tea, okay? They say some people are born in the wrong generation, but I was born in the wrong continent, okay? Um, so, but we watch a lot of British shows, mostly crime shows, because I can't do too much drama, okay? I can't do it. Soap opera stuff is the same in daytime television as it is in British dramas. Okay, but... We, I, I love, we love those shows. I love good British dialogue. But anyway, one of the things is a lot of, some of the shows we've watched are in like really rural areas of, of Britain, you know, whether it's set in Scotland, in the northern area where things are more spread out. And especially when they're in those northern areas or some of these um, by the sea, man, there's just some incredible landscapes. I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, videos of, or pictures of that, but just these like green rolling hills. And it's always like, it's always like drizzle, you know, constantly. And, 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 and every time there's a shot, it's like it's always foggy and like there's never a sun, it seems like. So I don't know why I want to live there. But I just saying, but it makes the green look like so green, right? Because it's, it's, always, it's always wet, you know, it's always got moisture and it's like these green rolling hills and they hit these cliffs that just like drop off. And then there's a beach down there and the sea, you know, and then sometimes you have these roads that are just like, they just wind through these beautiful like, I don't know, just beautiful green rolling hills. And there's, I mean, I just think it's the coolest thing. I always say we should go there sometime, but we don't. Okay, but someday, someday we're gonna go there and see that, that, that kind of landscape. I just love that landscape. That's, for me, that's one of those things, like I think that's the prettiest thing. Like some of you love like the tropical and the beach. Like I burn, I don't like it. Okay, so, but like that kind of stuff, it's like, oh man, that's just the most, it's just the most beautiful thing. When I think of pasture, that's where I, I, that's where I go. That just like green that looks too green, you know, and it's these beautiful rolling hills and the landscape behind it. We've even watched some shows where it's like, yeah, it's like there's th- things with livestock and other things. Like that's what they're, that's where they graze in these just beautiful Areas, that's what I think of. But guys, that's the best I can do. That's the best I can think of when I think of pasture. But when Jesus says, you will find pasture and I have come to give you life and life to its full, it's a whole lot more than green rolling hills. That's what I want you to understand. When I, as a human being, I see that and I just think, oh man, is there anything more beautiful? When I think of pasture, that's, that's all I can think of. But remember, I am, says, I have come that you may find pasture. When he's talking about pasture, he's not talking about green grass. He's talking about eternity. He's talking about things, he's talking about life that's everlasting. It's just incredible. Jesus cares about your eternity. And him being the gate is not just an exclusivity thing. That's what I want you to understand today. It is. When Jesus says these, there were exclusive statements. He's saying, I am the gate. That was the only way in and out of the fold. He says, I am that. But when we take it like that, sometimes we miss it. The truth is, he's saying, you can't find it without me. And I want to lead you there. And so the exclusive things become, becomes less of a, a thing of him saying, well, there's no other way. And I'm just going to control you. He's saying, no, there's no other way. And let me show you to it. Because there's no other way that justice can be served for the fall of man. He says, but if you come here, uh, this, this quote from the Life Application Bible Commentary, I uh, just like this, it said this, the sheep find pasture, not as a result of, of their diligent searching, but through the gracious provision of the shepherd. That's what it's about. That's when Jesus says, I am the gate. He's saying, let me show you. With a gracious heart, I'll show you and you can find pasture. I am the gate He is saying, and when he says that, he says, I am the way to eternal life. I want you there to experience it. Come this way. 
So in these towns where many people own sheep, I talked about earlier how maybe shepherds would bring them all together just because they would use, there would be one good fold maybe in that area, and so they would all use it. Or in, especially in these smaller towns, you might have like, you know, you own a handful of sheep, but you couldn't, it wouldn't be practical to have a shepherd for a handful of sheep and have a bunch of them out there. And they also couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to do that, and so they would all have these collective flocks for this small town. And so you have this big flock of sheep, but it was like five were his and probably 12 were Dean's. I mean, he would have a lot. And then, you know, it, whatever, you know, I just had to give you that one. But all right, you have more sheep. I get it. Okay. So, but here's the thing. I, when I think about that, though, that stresses me out. Because I don't know about you, I don't think I could tell the sheep apart. I mean, it'd be like, uh, it's the one with the wool, it's uh, got the long face, it's got hooves, I think. Um, like, how would you, it'd be like, it's that one, you know, and you just do that generic, like, it's that one, and just hope he knew, you know, or whatever. It's just like, that stresses me out. But the interesting thing is, they didn't have to worry about that. Because when, in those cases, like say when the owner came, the true owner came, or in those cases where you had multiple shepherds, you think you have large flocks, and then you'd have three or four shepherds that put them all in this huge fold. The thing is, when their shepherd would call them, they would come, and the others would just stay there because they didn't know the other person. And that's, that's what Jesus is talking about in verses three through five. It says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. So what's the point? True followers of Jesus know his voice. And true believers, as sheep belonging to the true shepherd, would never follow someone pretending to be their shepherd. They know the difference. And that was Jesus' original teaching here. And then he had to explain why. And he said, I'm the gate. And he goes on to say, I'm the good shepherd, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks here and what that's about. But Jesus in this passage says, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. He's saying everything else is counterfeit. Everything else looks good, but it's not. But the true disciples can tell the difference. He says true believers, they'll know his voice. And my, my question for you today is this, do you know his voice? Do you know his voice? There's a lot of voices to listen to. There's a lot of things being offered up. There's a lot of people saying things that sound good. There's a lot of people saying, if you do this, it'll lead to this or that. But he says, all those come to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, all of them will be counterfeit. Here, he's, this, is, this passage is very much him saying, there's all these people that will claim to be Messiah. He says, but the one true one, they'll know. The true sheep, they'll know because they'll know his voice. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and they'll find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Do you know his voice today? Let's pray. Worship team.